It says here. I need a dose of fuck it all. Where is that? Oh, there it is. Good evening, asshats, assholes, and ass clowns, meatheads, hotheads, and hopheads, and of course, esteemed honorable subscribers. Welcome to Before the Mast, episode 16, a show where drunken debauchery meets deck plate drama. I am Aaron Burks, your host with a face for radio and a voice for silent movies. Tonight, we're going to try Old Faithful, the whiskey sour, but we're going to try it with egg white. I'm trying this because a couple of good friends, encompassing the Navy, the Army, and civilian life, have all been like, oh, I love whiskey sours, but I like mine with egg white. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and those who are unaffiliated, I'm all for a tot for breakfast, so we'll try it with egg tonight. If I like it, I'll eat it for breakfast again tomorrow. After that, I'll try to explain my life in the military, spanning two branches, 15 years, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But first, let's head to the Laka Laka Lounge to get loosened up with boozy beverages. Cheers. Oh, have we not done the... Nope. I've not done the, uh, the making yet. I don't think so, Scooter. Oh. Yeah. Eh. Let's just make another one for your viewing pleasure. Okay then. For this drink, you will need whiskey. Any whiskey will do. Bourbon, Tennessee, rye. I'm going with bourbon. Maker's Mark. Lemon juice. Simple syrup. Honey syrup. And an egg white. Not the whole egg. Just the white. I'm trying to be healthy on this show. Maker's Mark is a Spicier bourbon than the others that I've tried so far. Jim Beam is a pretty sweet bourbon. Maker's Mark almost almost fits the fits the bill of rye as far as flavor palette is concerned. It's got a big flavor. So because of that, I'm going to be using honey syrup along with simple syrup to kind of make those flavors melt together a little better. If I were using Jim Beam, I would just use straight simple syrup. Now, if you prefer a less sweet drink, you can tamp your, your sweetener back. If you like a sweeter drink, I don't give a shit, dump the whole bottle in. And of course, a cocktail shaker with ice and a chilled coupe glass. Let's build this jump off. We're going to start with two ounces of Maker's Mark. And then two ounces of lemon juice. Half an ounce of simple syrup and half an ounce of honey syrup. 
and then one egg white. Now let's add some ice. Give that a good shake. I hope you have your chilled coop glass. Fantastic. Now we're just gonna double strain that. And we're gonna garnish that with a maraschino cherry. And there it is, the whiskey sour with egg. Now, if I were going by nomenclature, this is a flip, not a sour. The way I understand this is that if it has an egg white, it's a flip. Back in the day, and I mean way back, back when ships were made of wood and men were made of iron. Flip was a mixture of beer, rum, and sugar, flash heated with a red hot poking iron, which made the drink frothy. Well, nowadays we keep our fire pokers out of our drinks and we just use breakfast foods to provide the texture. This is a whiskey sour flip. We'll just call it a sour to make it easy. If you know more than I do about the nomenclature, and if you do, that's okay. Damn it, Jim, I'm an artist, not a bartender. Please let me know in the comments. Cheers. You know, I am, I am pleasantly surprised. This, uh, the egg white really adds, uh, adds something to this. I am, I'm shocked because I'm not really one for raw egg. With the egg, I think I could probably take down the sweetness a notch since you have one more component as a mixer, but it's good the way it is. It's delicious. That, yeah. I could throw that one back all night and all morning. Speaking of confusing nomenclature, something I get asked a lot in veteran circles is, what branch were you in? My initial answer usually depends on who's asking. Is it the government? Army retired. Is it a sailor? Navy. Is it a soldier? Army. Is it a civilian? Both Navy and Army. Invariably, no matter who's asking, I end up telling the whole convoluted tale once the next question pops up. How long were you in for? Well, I was in the Navy for 13 years and the Army for three years. But you retired from the Army? Yep. When did you join the Navy? 1995. When did you get out? 2009. Now, if the math on that doesn't initially raise questions, the next round of questioning usually does. When did you join the Army? 2004. And this is where the whole ball of yarn has to be unraveled. And then there's appearing in uniform, which can get awkward. See, I'm a member of couple different veterans organizations and I have to attend certain functions like parades or funeral honors for other veterans in uniform. Without fail, there will be someone who is either some sort of military historian 
or a stolen valor warrior thinking they're doing the Lord's work, or AR670-1 lawyer who will come up to me and say, I see you have an ESWAS pin, but you're in army uniform. I didn't know you could get that in the army. That's because you can't. So why are you wearing it? Well, I... And what's that? I've never seen that. It's a Coast Guard Meritorious Unit Commendation. Ooh, I see you were with the third ID. In Iraq, yes. And here is where the questioning becomes... adversarial. Where are they located? Fort Stewart. How long were you there for? Well, I've never been to Fort Stewart. I was in Missoula with the 273rd ACR attached to the 3rd ID. Well, I've never heard of the 273rd. It's a Tennessee National Guard Armored Cavalry Regiment. I thought you said you retired from the Army. I did. Oh, and you're wearing an infantry cord, but you're with an armor unit? I joined the Navy in 1995 and attended boot camp right out of high school in 1996. Right after that, I was stationed on the USS Peleliu. And the worst thing that could happen to any seagoing sailor happened. And I was stationed at NAS Lemoore in 2001. If you ever have a chance to go to Lemoore, don't. When people ask me what I thought about NAS Lemoore, my answer is always the same. I go back to Missoula before I go back to Lemoore. And I mean that. A lot happened while I was in Lemoore. 9-11 happened. The invasion of Iraq happened. Meanwhile, I was being a forklift jockey in a warehouse supplying the barracks complex. I did everything from inventorying barracks items to hauling refrigerators up narrow stairwells to the third floor without any help. I got an eval that literally said that I saved the Navy millions of dollars by completing the work myself rather than outsourcing it. But my status was promotable. For those of you who don't know, in the Navy eval system, promotable despite it sounding positive, is synonymous with shitbag. Now, I didn't get promotable because I was a shitbag. I was an asshole, not a shitbag. I got it because I was attached to supply department, where the chief dutifully explained to me during my evaluation that he had to take care of his guys first. So he gave all of them the early promotes and less promotes, leaving me with promotable. Now I will admit that I have had, have, the attitude of an 85 year old that has equal disdain for everyone. So I'm sure that helped me get this stellar appraisal. Well, color me more annoyed than normal. We had just invaded Iraq. Felt like I wasn't doing anything but rotting in Lamor. I requested a transfer back to sea. It was denied. I requested to be deployed to Iraq. It was denied. So in October 2003, after eight years in the Navy, I got out. First, I went to the Coast Guard, and they were positive I could join, but I would have to get taken a rank. I was okay with that because the Coast Guard seemed like a decent life. Slid the paper across the table for me to sign, grabbed the pen with my right hand and the paper with my left hand. The chief groaned and took the paper back. Well, it turns out hand tattoos were a big no-go in the Kogo. So I went to the Army. They weren't taking prior service at that point in time. The recruiter told me to go to the National Guard. So I did. I 
found myself as a sergeant in California National Guard, Alpha Company, 3rd of the 160th Infantry Regiment, 40th ID. I volunteered to go to Iraq. Oddly enough, no slots were available. I was instead deployed to the Sinai Peninsula as part of the Multinational Force and Observers. It was supposed to be a cake mission. And for that, I was disappointed. I didn't join as an infantryman to go on a cakewalk. It's okay though, because it didn't take long before the shit started hitting the fan and blowing back in our faces. We were harassed, bombed, bombed again. On this, I will not go into detail. I was there for a full year. And I realized something. I liked being a sailor way more than I liked being a soldier. So the day I got back, January 27, 2006, I went to the Navy recruiter who told me that the best way back in was to join the Navy Reserve and go active from there. So that's what I did. I was attached to Beachmaster Unit 1. Finally, I was able to go back into the active Navy in July. I was sent to Chicago until I received my orders. USS Gary in Yokosuka, Japan. From Gary, I went to USS McCampbell. A snippet of how that all went down can be found on episode two, the aviation and why I hate flying. Well, my detailer told me, for those of you who were unaware, in the Navy, detailers are the only people in the military who may be more adept at lying than recruiters. Detailers are the people who decide where you go next. If you know your detailer, you may be okay. And again, maybe not. If you ask for San Diego, they'll give you Norfolk, tell you how good the weather is and how relaxed the atmosphere is. I asked for anything on the West Coast. My detailer gave me Yakuska, Japan. So far fucking west, it's on the east coast of another continent. He told me Japan was a career enhancer, a place that virtually ensures upward mobility. This was important to me, because by the end of this enlistment, I'd be up against what the Navy called high year tenure. Basically, if you fail to make a certain rank by a certain year, you're forced out of the service. My high year tenure was 13 years, and I was now at 10. My detailer told me that I needed this assignment because it's hard to get to first class as a bosun mate. And Japan's hard operational tempo would ensure that I got bumped up ahead of my peers. On the outside, everything seemed to fall into place. As a second-class petty officer, I was the LPO of Death Division, normally a first-class petty officer billet. I was cross-qualified in things that bosun mates usually don't do, aviation fuels or flying squad team leader, for example, and then all the normal small ship stuff that goes along with being the lead guy of deck, flight deck safety, safety, Underway replenishment, POIC, etc., etc. I took my first class exam and passed it. I was maxed out for personal awards. I had seven years of sea time, eight years of sea time. This time my evals were actually quite good. Still, I didn't make it. Couldn't feel too bad about it. Nobody made it. I think only like 10 people made BM1 that go around. I was approached by an officer who told me that I would have a chance at being capped. Basically an on-the-spot promotion by the captain. If I got my ESWAS pin. Uh, yes. The pin that started the whole story. Well, I was already stretched thin, but I did it. I 
I did it in less than two months. I didn't sleep much in that time, and I'm fairly certain I was a terrible human being for that time period. But I did it. And then the time for spot promotions came along, and... Nothing. Well, I had one test left. My eval for this one was a shining example of nautical excellence. At a 4.1, I was ranked number 15 out of all the second classes in Yakuska. I had an early promote and a pat on the back, but I still didn't make it. Curtains for this career. Except for there was a program at the time called Blue to Green, in which naval personnel could seamlessly transfer to the Army. So I filled that out and was sent to Washington State to separate from the Navy and integrate into the Army. Except for that some clown at Big Navy personnel filled out the wrong paperwork. And the Army recruiter looked at me and pretty much told me that the only way I could get in the Army at this point was to come see them once I was a civilian. So, I was out of the military completely and unexpectedly. I was mad. I'm a little bitter. Kicked around the Mississippi River Delta for a while as a deckhand on a dredge barge until I ended up at the Tennessee National Guard recruiter volunteering for a deployment. He told me that Tennessee doesn't have infantry, but they could attach me to an armored cavalry regiment. And within a month, I was in Missoula, Iraq. Well, it's not what I had hoped for, being an infantryman attached to an armor unit in charge of protecting convoys between Tikrit and the Turkish border. But rarely had I ever gotten what I hoped for. It was towards the end of this tour that things started to catch up with me. And without going into detail, I ended up getting retired from the Army. Because all these issues were caused during combat, the retirement was from the Army and not the Guard. In fact, I was retired twice. So that's it. That's why I wear an ESWAS pin on my Army dress blues. I earned that shit. I'm damn well wary. And then now I get asked who I root for in the Army-Navy game. Well, I wait until the last half of the fourth quarter before I decide who I'm affiliated with this year. I also get asked which I like better. Well, Navy. Why? Well, in the Navy, you go on a six-month deployment, you see exotic locales, cultures, and enjoy interesting drinks. At sea, life can be tough, but generally the payoff is in the liberty. Oh. In the Army, on the other hand, they deploy you for a full year, and it's usually to the worst hellhole on the planet. And from that, there is no escape but to grin and bear it and try to live long enough to make it home. Well, I hope you enjoyed my labyrinthine shit show of a life story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may we live to learn well and learn to live well. Excuse me.
always make enough for two, even if you're only one. No. I'm going to definitely have one of these for breakfast in the morning. Ooh. It's almost morning. Hey.